Okay. That's fine. <laughs> Welcome to the Alabama Aquariums Boardwalk Talk Series. My name is Mendel Graber. I am uh, one of the educators here at the lab. And this morning we are going to be chatting with PhD student Zoe Hendrickson, who um, is here at the C Lab in uh, Dr. Charlie Martin's lab. And um, she is working on invasive species and she is going to talk with us a little bit this morning about invasives and the work that they're doing in their lab and um, some of the important information that uh, you can take away about invasive species and and um, you know how we might be able to affect uh, positive change mm -hmm. with regard to invasives mm -hmm. awesome all right well I will get started hi everyone thank you for joining me today so um, I have done uh, my master's research on uh, pathways of introduction for invasive species and I'll talk a little bit more about that in a minute, but um, today I'll be talking specifically about aquatic invasive species and marine invasive species and what that means are just invasive species that live in or around freshwater or aquatic environments or marine environments. So um, I also want to start off with defining what an invasive species is because we most of us have heard the words invasive species and there's a lot of associations we then make about that. But um, let's start off with a clear definition so we know what we're all talking about. So an invasive species is defined as a non-native species that is introduced into an area and it causes um, harm to ecosystems, the economy, or human health. And that later part of the definition is the really important part. So you can have a non-native species that isn't necessarily invasive and what we mean by non-native is something that isn't originally found here. So for a very, you know, wow example, we could go with uh, kangaroos are native to Australia. But if we saw one hopping around outside here, that would be very alarming. They are not native here. How did a kangaroo get here? And that we'll has actually that. happened on Dauphin Island. Has not it? too distant past. Oh my word. Okay. Well, <laughs> I didn't know that. Um, so yeah. But it would be alarming. <laughs> At least it would be to me. So anyway, um, so non-native species has to be introduced, meaning brought to a new location. We'll talk about that as well. And then it has to cause um, those three types of harm. And so for a local example, I don't specifically study lionfish, but um, it's a really great example of these effects that native, uh, excuse me, invasive species can have. So for ecological harm, these guys are in a new environment. They're a novel predator, so they're a new predator that little fish don't know what to do with. So this thing swims up to a little fish, it's completely mesmerized and it just gets eaten. It does not know to run away. So that's an example of ecological harm, is uh, high levels of pred predation by a new predator. Um, economic harm, anytime we have an aquatic invader, it is really, really hard to remove um, or control once it gets here because you know these guys are in the ocean. Um, I don't know if you've tried to control something that's floating out in the ocean, but it's really, really hard. And it can cost millions and millions of dollars to um, eradicate and control these types of species, um, which hurts our wallets, hurts the economy. Um, in addition, for the uh, negative effects to human health, I don't know if you guys can see these wonderful, beautiful spines that they have. These are venomous, and I don't know about you guys, but my health is negatively affected by being stabbed by a venomous spine. So um, that's a good example of a marine invasive species. So that's kind of the first half of you know what we look at. Well, um, let me just clarify that it doesn't have to meet all three of those criteria to right. uh, be right. considered an invasive. It can meet any one of them. This is true, yes. And a lionfish just happened to meet all three, so they are just really great. Um, but yeah, thank you for that clarification. And um, so yeah, in uh, my research, I have studied pathways of introduction. So that's how invasive species are getting here in the first place and how do we stop that from happening. Um, so a pathway of introduction, a really common one, um, again, this is the case for lionfish and a lot of other uh, invasive species, is the aquarium and pet trades. So we are purposefully importing non-native species. And um, a lot of the time, if you're feeling really bad, you're fish has outgrown its tank. We call those tank busters for a reason. Um, you have a really, really big fish and you're like, I just can't take, of, take care of little Jimmy anymore. 
I'm going to release him into the lake and he'll have a wonderful life. Please don't do that. Um, because if, if you're having that idea, there's probably other people that have that idea too. If little Jimmy finds a little Janie and they make more fish, then you now have an established invasive population. Um, if those fish are causing harm. If they're not really causing any harm, then it's just a non-native population, they're just there. But um, it's also a bit difficult to study those impacts too. So there, there is a gray area between non-native and invasive. Right, so she's clarifying that a species might be identified as non-native and it might not have a, an invasive like tag on it uh, and I, it might, might not have been identified as invasive. But that doesn't necessarily mean that it's not invasive. It may mean that the, you know, the impacts that it's having are um, uh, unclear. Yeah, yeah, unclear or largely. They're not understood. Yeah, because it can have like little effects too that trickle down um, to different ecosystem interactions, predation, uh, competing for resources, and again, that can be kind of hard to study. So um, let's see. So I was at uh, releasing your pets. Don't do that. Um, I also want to say um, the uh, compelling feeling to release an animal is that it'll have a better life out in the wild. A lot of the time, that's not even true. Um, if the environment does not meet the needs for that uh, non-native animal, it will die. And so that happens a lot of the time too. So just because you release something doesn't mean it'll necessarily become invasive, but um, the more times you do it and the hardier the species, the more, um, the more likelihood it will be in invasive. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, and then uh, with that, with the releasing and movement of species, um, I'll get to movement in a minute, but um, we have this really wonderful map behind me of our watershed. So this is our watershed that we live in, meaning all of these connected rivers end up draining down through the Mobile Bay. So if I were to go and say, release a bunch of fish at one time, that's super illegal. Don't do that. Um, but if I were to release something over here and a, a population establishes over in this waterway, because all these little rivers and things are connected, um, aquatic invaders can spread a lot more easily over large distances rather than other types of invasive species. That's kind of what makes these species more egregious and harder to control. Um, and it's also difficult because you can see that this watershed, yeah, so there's a state line between Alabama and Mississippi. So um, invaders do not care about geopolitical boundaries. Um, if you release something in Mississippi, it could very well easily spread to Alabama uh, despite there being a state line there. So watersheds are, are the real kind of delineation for this. Um, it doesn't mean that something would stay contained to a one watershed either. So you can have a lot of spread from um, just one little location in uh, a watershed. So uh, from there, I kind of want to talk about other things that we can do to prevent the spread of invasive species. Well, let's, let's clarify that there are an awful lot of pathways of introduction. This so is true. I can maybe, talk about more. Yeah, so if you wanted to list some, or if that's kind of like, you know, one of your major areas of focus, we yeah. can kind of go down that route. Let's but do just it. To, just to make it clear, there are, there are a lot. lot. Yeah. So, um, you know, just kind of circling back to the importance of understanding these mm -hmm. pathways of introduction. Yeah. Um, Invasives have a number of characteristics that they, there's kind of like a common suite of characteristics that allow a species to become invasive. Yeah. So um, they tend to, not, not by, def, by definition, but typically if they don't exhibit these characteristics, they don't tend to become They're, invasive. Yeah, let's so see. they are typically, um, generalists, they, they are not specialists, meaning um, say a uh, koala has a very specialized diet. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's a specialist rather than a generalist. I have a really good example of that too. Um, so a really, uh, a really common aquatic invader are crayfish. They're, um, they're very, very generalist eaters. They're um, omnivores, so they'll eat just about anything that comes across their path, which makes it really easy for them to spread to new environments. Um, so there are a lot of invasive crayfish that do that. Mm -hmm. So that's a, a good example for that. Um, yeah. So yeah, just a few, you know, a few other common characteristics. They tend not to have um, predators 
or at least you know a big enough population to keep their population in check in places where they're introduced um, you guys feel free to join us we are talking about invasive species um, and so they do tend to be they, they so if we're talking about generalists going back to that concept a little bit mm -hmm. we were talking about diet but other things you know in, in the case of plants you know they have very um, uh, broad character um, uh, broad environmental conditions that they can succeed in so mm -hmm. um, you know they can succeed in um, really rich soil and compete effectively with the native species they can live in sandy soil they can thrive in you know a salty environment so those are some of some examples of how an organism might be a generalist rather than a specialist yeah um, which allows them to kind of spread yeah and to jump on that, um, another characteristic that makes aquatic invaders um, kind of unique and, well, I don't want to say that. I want to say that uh, invasive species in general, if something is able to reproduce really quickly and um, make a lot of babies at once, so plants are really good at this. They just release a bunch of seeds and especially if they're an aquatic plant, all those seeds float down the watershed and spread everywhere. Um, so uh, fish that are, um, really frequent uh, reproducers and they re reproduce a lot of babies at once. Um, they're really good invasive species. And that's another reason. So when you have a hardy species like that, that can survive in a lot of different environments, that can eat a lot of different things, um, those are also really popular species in trade because you can put them in a bag and ship them across the sea and they'll be fine. Like they'll, once you get to the pet store, like they'll be still alive. If somebody takes it home, their little fish isn't going to die immediately. So um, in the case of plants too, you can go to your um, Home Depot garden center and a lot of those plants are extremely, extremely hardy species. And that's why we sell them. You don't want the customer to be upset that their product has died. Mm -hmm. um, so there's a lot of that in trade. You can also have really fragile species in trade because you know there's a lot of hobbyists out there that want something really rare. So that's not always the case, but it is a big reason why we see a lot of aquatic invasors, um, excuse me, invaders coming from the pet trade or the aquarium trade mm -hmm. or the ornamental plant trade. Um, as long as we're talking about pathways, I can talk about a few more that we see. Sure. So yeah. I, I was just going to kind of emphasize the importance of understanding those pathways because once they are introduced, they're very, I mean, um, you know, by the nature of these characteristics, they're very difficult to control. If they weren't difficult to control, we would be able to effectively control them and they wouldn't be invasive species. Yeah. Um, so it's really important that we don't introduce them in the first place. So, you know, that would be our best way to manage the invasive species problem is by not creating the problem. Yeah. So understanding these pathways of introduction and how we can cut those off, you know, is really essential to addressing the problem of invasives. Yeah. Uh, an analogy that we use a lot of the time with uh, invasive species entry and pathways is, oh man, well, if you let the cat out of the bag, then good luck getting the cat back in the bag. So um, prevention of, uh, we, we, we term the stopping of flow of invasive species through a pathway as just broadly prevention or prevention management. And what that means is that if you can, you know, identify a pathway, figure out how that in, invasive species coming into the US, you can target that pathway and just prevent it from ever getting here in the first place. So um, I have an example. We can talk about the moss ball if we yeah. want to. So, and you have yeah, like, ask questions, yeah. make comments, join the conversation. Yeah, very conversational. But um, I don't know if anyone has seen one of these before. This is a Marimo moss ball. They are from um, originally Japan, but they grow in other really high latitude, cold, uh, freshwater lakes. Um, he is my pet. I just bought him like a week ago. Um, and these guys, they're really, really popular in trade because you can see he's very cute. You know, people put little cowboy hats on these things. Like people love these because they're easy. You put them in a jar, it's your little pet. It's like a pet rock, but it's actually alive. Um, so with these moss balls, and you can pass it around if you want to. Um, so these guys are really, really popular in trade. In 2021, so they're actually an algae. They're not actually a moss. I do want to say that. Um, 
and they grow in like a circular fashion. So in 2021, up in Washington State, a, uh, a person in a pet store who worked there uh, called up, I think it was the US Fish and Wildlife Service, and they said, hey, I just found a baby zebra mussel on this moss ball. And if you guys have not seen zebra mussels before, let me see if I can, come on. Okay, it doesn't. Can me to try? Yeah, if you don't mind. <laughs> Thank you. Mm -hmm. So zebra mussels are a really, really horrible invasive species up in the Great Lakes. They will clog um, buoys, they clog intake pipes, they cover propellers. Anything that they can adhere to, they basically cover. They're a really problematic species. So they found one of these um, up in Washington. They haven't invaded that area yet, and so they're freaking out. They're like, oh my gosh, these things are hitchhiking on these little moss balls. Are they everywhere in the US? And so my committee member who works for the US Geological Survey said, well, let me check. So we were down in Gainesville, Florida. He goes over to Petco. He said, hey, can I look at your moss balls? Sure enough, there were zebra mussels in those moss balls too. And we didn't know to look for them. So they were just popping up everywhere and they found them in, thank you so much, in 42 other states. So all of these were ripped off the shelves. They weren't allowed to be sold for about three years until I saw this in the pet store um, last week. And so I bought one because I've been obsessing about these for like three years. Um, so now they have a screening process where they sample the water that they're shipped in for zebra mussel DNA to see if the zebra mussel is present. So they have figured out the pathway and trade that they're coming from, a way that they can stop these at the border, test them for an invasive species before they're sent to Timbuktu and wherever. Um, so that was an example of a pet trade pathway for a hitchhiking species. Um, that normally comes in, um, so zebra mussels will normally come in through ballast water and then they spread on people's boats, in bait buckets, to other waterways. They're all up and down. Oh. Let's see. I'm going to see if I can show this picture for you guys. There we go. Maybe. Okay, there we go. So these are zebra mussels. They're tiny little mussels. Um, they're really easy to spread. They can actually, when, so this is a picture of a shopping cart that was sitting in the water. They've absolutely coated this shopping cart. And so they'll do that to just about anything. Um, if the PowerPoint gods let me show you. <laughs> I have another picture and they're covering a propeller, but they've actually covered um, like navigational buoys and things like that to the point where the buoys actually sink. So that can be a really big problem in the Great Lakes. So, um, so yeah, I don't know where I was going with that. But <laughs> um, my point is, is these things can come into the, the US in a number of different ways. Um, I didn't talk about ballast water, but that's another really, really big pathway. So a ship in port A will take in some water. It leaves off some of its cargo, takes in some water to keep the ship steady, comes all the way over to the US in port B releases that water and releases any species that are with it. So that's another pathway where we've identified and we've actually developed technology to prevent that from happening now. There we go, thank you. So yeah, that, I'd be pretty unhappy if I were a, a boat owner and that were my, my propeller. But, um, so yeah, I don't know, Mendel, do you have any? Well, you anything? said that so, yeah. eDNA is environmental DNA They can, um, um, look for it in the water. Mm -hmm. So um, you mentioned that they're now using that for zebra mussels. Can you uh, explain that? Yeah. Yeah. So environmental eDNA, uh, or just eDNA, I guess, um, what you can do essentially is take a sample of any water body, like you could go out into the bay and take a sample of the water. And the idea is, is if a, an invasive species is present, it leaves behind a DNA trace. So like, you know, as a human, you know, we're walking around, we're shedding hair, we're, you know, the other species do that in a similar way. And um, if we can pick that up in the water, um, it would be a really, really great way to identify um, where these species have invaded without having to physically go look. I mean, if you look at the bay today, it's, uh, it's very chocolate milk <laughs> resemblant. <laughs> Um, so in certain places, it's really, really hard to actually go looking for these things. So if we have this, um, this chemical way to do so, uh, 
it's an easier way to uh, detect things, early detection, and then you can have a rapid response to prevent that thing from spreading further. further. And in the case of the moss balls, um, it's working, they're using eDNA because you can't just rip these things open and look for a zebra mussel. At that point, you've destroyed the product. And so there's, you know, trade incentives to use this too, because if you're destroying your product, no one's gonna wanna buy it. So. Are these known to be invasive? The moss balls, no, because they have very specific, um, so that's a good example of a non-native that's not invasive. Um, they have very specific growth requirements. They grow in really, really cold lakes, and they grow really slowly, too. So there are moss balls that are about this big, but it'll take centuries, or not centuries, it'll take decades, maybe a century for it to get that big. So, yeah, it's more those zebra mussels because they're grown in areas where the zebra mussels are native to. Um, it's the Ponto Caspian region near the Ukraine. Okay, yeah. mm -hmm. that's what I was gonna ask. So yeah. these are grown in culture? Yeah, usually um, you can find them naturally. I think the only place they're naturally left is in Hokkaido, Japan. And um, they'll sell mosh balls um, in Hokkaido in their souvenir shops, but they all come from like the Ukraine <laughs> because they're endangered in Japan. So yeah, the problem with these is that they were sourcing these moss balls from areas where zebra mussels are growing too. And so when you ship, you know, essentially an aquatic plant or algae, those zebra mussels will hitchhike on that thing and get sent to other places. Well, okay, so let's talk about um, sort of the end goal of identifying these pathways. So mm -hmm. um, Zoe mentioned that the moss balls were identified um, by a, a, like an aquarium worker, right? Mm -hmm. a, like a, oh, yeah, a, a pet store worker. A pet yeah. store worker. And so reported that and it like shut down this, um, you know, the trade of this. And you said that you just found this recently. So do you know what has developed recently with the re resumption of the trade of these moss balls? Um, when I found them in the pet store, I immediately texted my committee member. Um, he's in charge of the non-indigenous aquatic species database for the USGS and was um, helping to kind of shut down that trade process. What he said is that they are monitoring these for environmental DNA now. They weren't doing that before. Mm -hmm. um, so that's the new method that they're using. They've also used zebra mussel sniffing dogs before. Um, they've done this for um, python detection in the Everglades too. There's a beagle named Python Pete, hardest working member of the US Fish and Wildlife Service, um, or it might be national parks. But yeah, so there's um, this new method is supposed to prevent that you know, pathway for zebra mussels. However, um, I bought this as soon as I saw it because um, if they need to be checked, I kind of want to be <laughs> helpful and check it. Because there's only about five in the store. I don't know how many they had back there and I don't know how many are um, coming and in now. Like, so where would that gate blade be? Is that when it's imported? Yeah, so, so. there's specific um, ports of entry for plants and animals. So animals are typically regulated for um, invasive species reasons by the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. If it's an agricultural product or a plant or something you're using potentially for aquaculture, um, that's more regulated by the USDA. But all of these things have to come in very specific ports of entry at the U.S. and be uh, specially inspected. And they often are uh, inspected on a risk-based uh, way. So you'll say, okay, this thing's coming in. Where did it come from? Um, it, does it have a history of being a problem for agriculture? So those species are targeted for inspection more so than other species. So originally moss balls, they're not a problem for agriculture. They're just aquarium things that we like to buy. So they weren't targeted for inspection. However, there was still a really um, problematic invader associated with them. So part of that is anticipating where these things might be showing up and then you can put regulations on it. I know people don't like the word regulations, but at the same time, like some of these invasive species, like I think it's green crabs. Um, there's a couple of different species of invasive crab, but if they're on the coast, if you're a fisherman, they will like cut up your nets, they will steal your catch. There's things, there's reasons why. Oh yeah, we want to regulate that. Yeah. Uh, Less of a pain leader. Right. Yeah. Um, so, you know, there's one example of identifying that pathway of introduction and that mm -hmm. resulting in some meaningful, um, you know, prevention. Mm -hmm. So, uh, Zoe also mentioned 
ballast water as a pathway of introduction. Um, and just to explain that a little more, mm -hmm. if you think about a, a ship, um, a, a big ship, if it's out in the ocean without ballast, which is like a weight that goes in the bottom of the ship, mm -hmm. um, it tends to ride higher. So say this is your water line, the ship will ride higher and it, and it rolls more. So they'll take on ballast to lower their center. And then when they go into ports, they're going into shallower water typically. And so they would um, eject that ballast because you know they want to, they do want to rise at that point. Um, and so when the ballast was kind of really recognized as a, as a major pathway of introduction, they take on, so they take on ballast water in Alabama, mm -hmm. and then they go, you know, to somewhere in South America or vice versa, and then they're ejecting this um, ballast they're introducing species that are native to Alabama to South America or vice versa. Mm -hmm. You guys heard of the fire ant? Mm -hmm. So fire ants were introduced, it's thought that they were introduced into the port of Mobile in ballast dirt from South America and they have since crawled their way across the southeast um, and they, they do a lot of uh, environmental damage. Yeah. But um, in recognizing that, one of the measures that they can take is ejecting the ballast um, strategically. Mm -hmm. So if they take on freshwater ballast, um, then they can eject that ballast in salt water where those animals or those organisms are not as likely to um, survive, mm -hmm. so, or vice versa. So um, you know, in recognizing these pathways, we can take measures, you know, to prevent these introductions. Yeah, and there's been a lot of studies on the efficacy, like the um, how efficient ballast water exchange is. So if you're coming from um, a freshwater port in Europe and you have freshwater ballast, there's a certain point along your journey that they recommend that exchange to happen, so you get like maximum salt water, so all that freshwater stuff will die. And there's also um, a point where you get to the U.S. It's called the exclusive economic zone it's about 200 miles off of our coast and uh, you have to have done that exchange by the time you reach that zone um, so that you can't be bringing in um, species it's just not to say that if they <laughs> dump it at 225 miles it can't yeah. just right cross so that but yeah you would think that all the freshwater species would have perished as you said it, they don't observe yeah. uh, socio-political Right. Or geopolitical. Right. And balance. so you got to do the best that you can to account for that. And um, so, yeah, there, there are emergency cases where you can bring ballast water in. Like if there's a really bad storm and you cannot let go of your ballast, like they'll have you come in, you'll discharge it offshore um, to a facility that will then process it. Um, again, this is not perfect. We're still working out the kinks. In the, I say we as if I'm regulating this. It's the U.S. Coast Guard and the EPA. <laughs> um, but uh, yeah, there's also um, onboard systems that they're using now that'll cleanse the water as you go with like UV lights and things like that. So there's things we can do. Yeah. yeah. <clears throat> so um, Zoe is just kind of getting started on her um, work for her PhD. Do you see yourself going into um, like academic research or into like regulatory <laughs> um, work question. or, you know? Um, my entire master's was policy work, and um, it is not fun to read policy. It's very long. They make it as painful as possible, but every little word is meaningful. And so um, we're currently doing a project that's looking at aquatic hitchhikers. So if you're importing, importing an aquarium plant, we're looking to see like what kind of little invertebrates are on there. Some of these things we don't even know, like they're not even named species. So we, we need that data. So I'm helping with that project um, for my own stuff. Uh, I'm likely going to try and go more of the management route, doing research, research to help um, develop tools for managers so that they can make informed decisions. Um, I'm currently looking at plant structural complexity. So like if you have a blade of grass versus like um, a hydrangea bush, those are two differently structured plants and they can harbor different species. And I'm looking, that in, looking at that in the aquatic area. So I'm trying to find out, uh, is there a way we can categorize easily 
the structure of plants and is that then associated with the amount of hitchhikers and so if you're bringing things in you can kind of class them that way and you can probably hopefully hypothetically assess so like risk, maybe budget but, time for scrutinizing yeah. different different categories of plants right. exactly so there's different things we can do with that information and just new ways we can think about um, the species we're bringing in and the potential impact that they might have there's a lot of unknown risk right now with bringing in these species so just to um, talk about that a little bit the um, kind of the various roles of these different um, organizations or agencies or institutions the sea lab the uh, the aquarium is the public aquarium of the Dauphin Island Sea Lab and we are a um, research institution so the role that the research science plays in this process is um, you know informing the management and the and the regulation we don't we don't write regulations the sea lab doesn't produce regulations or enforce regulations or anything um, but they do the science that the managers and the regulators can use to um, make better decisions about you know how best to um, manage these species or these ecosystems um, and how to you know craft meaningful regulations that um, yeah. you know will will be the most effective yeah. so that's kind of what I was wondering yeah. um, about where um, no, Zoe sees herself going <laughs> staying in academia or kind of going into one of those other roles yeah. um, I will say like my master's project was essentially telling the federal government uh, where the gaps in their authority exist and providing recommendations on management and there's a lot of caveats to that there's a lot of interest involved and so um, it could be kind of stressful at times because if you say hey we should do this there's going to be 25 other people saying well I disagree with that ah, and it's like okay um, so it's it's really interesting work and I think it's very impactful where you can do that work but um, I would like to jump more on the science side for a mm -hmm. while yeah. So um, can you guys just kind of like tell us where you're from? Yeah. I can tell you what invasive species are. Not <laughs> better. Yeah. So um, where are you guys from? Uh, we're from New Orleans. Oh, nice. And it's funny you talk about crayfish because it's a mm -hmm. coloring place. Uh -huh. I think that they're destroying other environments is, you know, makes us enjoy eating them a little bit more. Yeah. No. And I think usually when you're doing a crawfish boil, it's oh, yeah. so in science it's crayfish. Anywhere else is crawfish crawdads, yeah. you know. Um, but uh, which you guys know. But uh, <laughs> but yeah, no. A lot of the time you're eating an invasive species or a species that might be native to that area, but invasive in another. So like, yeah, don't feel bad. Well, <laughs> aquaculture. Yeah. So um, you've got farm-raised species that are you know uh, typically farmed for food mm -hmm. um, and then if they well okay yeah or I mean I said food but for example nutria yeah. <laughs> nutria were introduced into Louisiana for the fur trade mm -hmm. um, and it always seems like a really good idea at the time <laughs> and uh, you know escaped from their their enclosures mm -hmm. um, so, and, and another thing is that um, New Orleans, you know, is a port city, so, yeah. oh. you know, you have some of those yeah. introductions. And a lot of times um, we see warmer areas that are more yeah. subject mm -hmm. to establishment. Yeah. Um, they're just more, it's like they're, the climate is more favorable for a lot mm -hmm. of species to thrive so I was thinking while you were yeah. talking about you know Im importing um, like nursery products mm -hmm. a few years ago we started seeing a new species of lizard yep. in this area the yep. brown Cuban anole we have native anole mm -hmm. lizards the little lizards that can turn brown and green mm -hmm. um, but it's thought that these were being brought in in yep. like you know um, nursery plants yeah so um, one of the species I did as a case study for my previous work was the Cuban tree frog. And they, it's a similar thing. Um, they come in on horticultural imports and like palm trees and things like that. And so actually in Louisiana, um, there's the Audubon Zoo. I don't know yeah. exactly where it is, but um, unfortunately I've never been there, but I, I need to go. Yeah. Oh, cool. Uh, 
Right. They imported a bunch of palm trees mm -hmm. from South Florida for their um, elephant enclosure, and then they started seeing Cuban tree frogs popping up, and it's because they came on those palm trees. And that's happened from Florida a number of places, but to touch on the whole warm area being a better climate, so just like the snowbirds come down here and it's more temperate for them, um, meaning the like folks, the people <laughs> that come down, the birds do. But um, yeah, warmer climates uh, are able to kind of uh, be a more hospitable environment for these species. And so we've seen Cuban tree frogs that have been introduced up in Kansas, but they don't make it because the, the winter's too cold. But Miami, on the other hand, Miami, Florida is an absolute hotspot for species. If you wanna see your pet store in live action, go down to Miami, you'll see flocks of parrots, you'll see iguanas, um, any type of aquarium fish, it's all in the canals. And it's because it's so warm down there that they can survive. Um, and then, I was gonna say one other thing about Cuban tree frogs. Oh, no, you mentioned um, port cities. So Mobile is a fairly large port, and so is New Orleans. In port cities, even marinas and boat ramps, those are pretty much a lot of the time hot spots for invasive species because boats are coming in, they're bringing in things um, in their ballast, they're bringing in things on their hulls. So there's hull fouling where organisms, algae, and all sorts of things will just grow on the outside of the ship. That's another pathway. And um, in addition, people know, hey, if I wanna you know, dump my pit somewhere, they'll just go over the local boat ramp and just kind of. Oh, because it's a public access it's a public point access to point. water. Yeah. yeah, I never thought about that before. Yeah, so you can find, like, it's really interesting because um, the correlation between invasive species presence and population, you can track that in areas of high density and high urban areas with a lot of people, there tend to be more invasive species because we're bringing them there mm -hmm. and releasing them or they escape, all that sort of thing. Well, and, and just with people are more mobile now, you know, yeah. they yeah. move around the world more than, you know, in human history. And so, and they bring things with them unintentionally. So not only are we moving products, but you know, yeah. We're just we're just more mobile. Where are you guys from? Yeah. Oregon. Oregon. Oh, hello. Oh, you guys hello. are. So, uh, are you all staying on Dauphin Island? Are you staying over? Uh, yeah. Well, mm -hmm. so um, Dauphin Island is you know Alabama. Um, a, lot of, a lot of people don't realize that, but mm -hmm. um, so you guys. Let's see. What part of Oregon? Are you coastal? Are you inland? Yeah. Yeah. Coastal. Yeah. Um, we're Albany, Oregon. We're between mm -hmm. Eugene and Salem. So, do you guys know any of you, any of the invasives that? Oh boy. Uh, <laughs> green crabs. See, uh, Asian mitten mit, mitten crabs. Yep. Chinese um, mitten crabs. Let's see, uh, the roshiers and crabs. Mm -hmm. um, tiger, tiger. Um, the tiger snails. Tiger snails. Siberian prawn, I think, is up near you yeah. guys too. Yeah. Yeah. So there, there's no catch limit on. On, uh, those, uh, on those crabs. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you catch female male, don't matter. Mm -hmm. That was a new chair. Yeah, there's almost a price tag on their heads. So mm -hmm. Oh yeah, like yeah. like there there are sometimes. Yeah. So I don't yeah. know if they're currently running a um, a, a bounty, but uh, I mean, you know, you used to be able to get like four dollars a tail or so for nutria tails. It's even more so, like in the Everglades, they have such a hard time finding the pythons down there, and they're so pro there's so many there, but they're so good at hiding. Mm -hmm. They have these tournaments all the time mm -hmm. for people to go down and just like get as many as you want. Biggest one gets like sometimes hundreds of dollars for these things. So yeah, it can be, it's really interesting. Um, and that's actually a good point as well, because sometimes when you have these invasive species coming in and we start putting price tags on, hey, if you catch it, you get this amount of money, people say, oh, all right. And so they'll sometimes try to establish things in different areas to get that going. And there's all these different incentives. So it's a very social problem as well. You can't just look at, like you can look at the pathway, but you gotta look at the economics of it. You gotta look at the ecology, the human aspect, not only for health, but also reasons why people might want these things here. Um, so you were, you, you started by talking about lionfish. Um, yeah. And you mentioned the venomous spines, but there are places typically, um, you know, in more southern latitudes than the northern Gulf, but where they have, um, uh, they can have 
ciguatera mm. um, toxins. So <clears throat> they are impacted by, they themselves are impacted by organisms that are not as much of a problem here because the water's colder. Mm -hmm. But then when people eat them, people are encouraged to eat lionfish here mm -hmm. because it's one way to try to incentivize address the problem. Mm -hmm. um, and by the way, they, they, they're not great about taking a hook. So mostly they're harvested by spear fishermen. Mm -hmm. um, but in more southern latitudes, um, the ciguatera poisoning can be a, a problem with eating them. So, yeah, you know, the, the trying to create these incentives, as you mm -hmm. said, can have some, yeah, it's, there's a social element to it. Yeah, and it's all really unique and really interesting. It varies by place. That's why this work is so interesting is because you, you can, there's so many ecological and social directions you can go with it. Um, one of the reasons I was excited to talk here today, though, is because a lot of people, you know, don't necessarily know what an invasive species is, or if they do, they have misconceptions. And so it's really great to have these conversations with people to kind of, you know, look at your own behavior or look at behavior of others and be like, hey, what are, what are we doing? You know? So, yeah. So, where are you from? Yeah. I'm from Auburn. Auburn, mm -hmm. Alabama. And do you know any invasives that are a problem Kudzu. where you're from? Yeah, yeah. Kudzu's Kudzu. a good one. Yeah. The vine that ate the south? Yeah. yeah. That's another one. I think they brought it in. Um, I'm not as good as my terrestrial plants as I am with my aquatics. But that's another one they brought in. They're like, wow, what a pretty vine. We're going to make everything look like, you know, Harvard, like ivy everywhere. <laughs> I think it was brought in. Uh, Use it to stabilize, um, like roadsides, where mm -hmm. the the um, area had been like denuded of plants. Mm -hmm. You know, to to build the roads and highways and yeah. interstates and um, plants. You know, the roots of plants do make really good um, land stabilization. And mm -hmm. you know, I think yeah. that was one of the ideas for use of. And so there's another thing that that um, we have had a history of trying to make use of these species that are really prolific and maybe that helps us control the population. Like, for example, um, we've got a grass here that's invasive called Kogan grass. And um, I think, you know, one of the proposed ways of addressing it was having cattle graze on it, but they won't eat it. Um, yeah. <laughs> you know, so just, just tricky yeah um it's tricky addressing these invasive species yeah. um and where are you from i'm from india india yeah. and do you know any in, uh invasive species in your yeah uh, some african algae uh -huh. okay yeah they were and they make many problems in watershed mm -hmm. fresh water yes is this microalgae or macroalgae it's a macroalgae oh wow okay yeah, so that's another thing is, do you know where, so it's from Africa, yeah, so it's from Africa. So that's another thing is there's some things from the U.S., like bass, like our, you know, run-of-the-mill mm -hmm. bass, mm -hmm. that are really, really invasive in other places, too. So it's not just things, like, coming to oh, the yeah. U.S., it's, it's exchange all over the world. And something I did want to mention earlier is, like, we've always moved species since the dawn of trade and human movement. We have always moved species. It's just we're really good at moving around now, like, we can have so many more ships, so many more aircraft. Um, so that's why we're seeing this higher rate of invasion is that we're just a lot better at getting around. And so, okay, I think we need to take this back around to why there's such a problem. Okay, you, you kind of, I mean, you said they cause environmental problems, but mm -hmm. let's clarify what kind of environmental problems they cause and why this is, um, why so much time and energy and money to trying to address this problem why is it such a big problem that's kind of a loaded question <laughs> but um, so there's a lot of different ecological or environmental problems that invasive species can cause it can be very species specific but in general um, for example with aquatic plants um, and animals too usually the big problem is that they're out competing native species and taking over an area and so 
when you have um, a non-native species out competing in like a multiple native species in a lot of cases, you end up with kind of a, a monoculture or like um, just like one plant dominating. That can lead to loss of biodiversity, which is really problematic because if you lose your biodiversity, your difference in species, you also lose function. Now there's some debate over the extent of which this is happening, but in general, that's the argument that is made. Um, other problems with aquatic plants, they can cause navigational hazards, um, change in habitat for your fish, which changes um, your resources for your fish and up the food chain and our sport fish. And um, a lot of these ecosystem dynamics will trickle out to other species and become a bigger problem with more spread. I don't know if that answered Yeah, yeah. so I was just going to say very broadly speaking, um, you know, this reduction in biodiversity, um, Zoe mentioned that the, you know, um, an outcome of a loss of biodiversity is loss of function. So if you have 50 different plant species in a, in a particular area, let's say an acre, and then you've got a plant like kudzu that comes in and it outcompetes all of them. Mm -hmm. um, you know, and, and, and by outcompete, it can um, grow faster and shade them so that they're not getting enough sunlight or, um, you know, and then they're kind of struggling to survive and then, you know, they're, they're not getting as many nutrients and mm -hmm. so they kind of die off. Um, then you're losing all of the different functions that they served in that area, in that ecosystem. Mm -hmm. um, and then you're, what you're left with is, is whatever, you know, function yeah. the, the kudzu serves. Yeah. So having these, this reduction in biodiversity can really um, impact uh, an ecosystem. And to kind of have an, function is kind of a, a broad word ecologists like to use because we're all like, oh yes, function, I understand. But to kind of give an example to that, especially with the trees and the kudzu, um, when you have different trees in an ecosystem, a lot of the time they serve different insect hosts, so different butterflies, different um, flies, different spiders. And um, then you'll have birds that eat those specific insects. So if you lose that specificity, like if the or even the, the berries or the nuts or even the berries the trees, yeah exactly yeah. like birds will eat that specific berry from that specific tree if you lose that diversity um, the kudzu is not necessarily going to fill that hole right so and and I used an acre just as a yeah, that's all right <laughs> but ain't necessarily restricted to that so you know it's if, you know if it were a one acre problem that would be one thing but yeah. And then um, another reason just to, you might be like, well, why are these invasive species so good at out competing? Well, in their native environment, they're competing with every other plant that has kind of grown up with them and evolved. And so when you take it out of that ecosystem and put it in a new one, it has no competitors. There's nothing that will stop it from growing and reproducing, um, especially if it lived in a very competitive environment before. And again, those are the species that we tend to like to have because they're easy to grow, easy to maintain. Well, and, and as she said, not every species is going to become invasive. Right. So some of this, some of them are going to die. Some can hatch it. <laughs> right, um, but it's yeah. the ones that are going to be very good at competing that become problematic. Yeah. So um, what would you, would you say that there's some kind of like broad takeaway message that you'd like to leave everyone with? Um, in general, when I think about invasive species. I try to think about things that I myself am purchasing. Um, so like with this, I need to be mindful of like where I dispose of the water. I don't want to just pour it down the drain because there might be invertebrate hitchhikers. I might open it up and find out. Um, but yeah, so just be mindful of the species that you're purchasing. Also, um, so before I get onto that, so what I mean by that is if you have an aquarium, don't just dump it into the waterway. If you're changing your water, there's um, ways you can kind of dump the water just straight into your yard and so if any of those hitchhikers they're not going down the drain because they're not necessarily going to die in the water treatment plant um, a lot of those snails and things will make it out into the environment and they may not be visible you they may not they be, may be like this goes with pathogens too um, like diseases uh, yeah. you know um, eggs larvae. yeah <laughs> eggs larvae fertilized eggs larvae yeah, yeah things that are um, not visible to the yeah. human eye 
so yeah just be mindful of that and if you need resources um, on which species to plant in your yard instead of invasive species there's a lot of native species that are beautiful that you can put in your yard um, instead of an invasive species from like home, home depot or something um, it helps your local community so much um, so almost every state agency that um, like a department of natural resources if you have a state fish and wildlife agency if you go online, almost every state agency has a page about invasive species or information about what you can do. If you want to look at the federal level, um, U.S. Fish and Wildlife has great resources, same with USDA. So just be mindful of the species that you're interacting with. Um, and then furthermore, be mindful of your behavior. So if you are recreating in a lake that has a known infestation of, say, hydrilla or Eurasian milfoil, go ahead and check your boat, check your canoe, check your trailer, just do a little inspection to make sure that the next lake over that maybe doesn't have an infestation, that you're not the one that's bringing stuff to the next place. So we can all play a role, and that, it can be a huge role too. Um, like zebra mussels are now in Lake Mead down in the southeast. They're nowhere near connected to the Great Lakes, but they're down, or not zebra mussels, quagga mussels, they're really similar. But they're down in Lake Mead because someone had them on their boat and brought them down without knowing. So there's a lot of things that we can do ourselves to prevent the spread. There's a website called Stop Aquatic Hitchhikers, yeah. and uh, it's a great read. So. Yeah, there's, a, there's another one yeah. that, um, I mean, it's, you know, it's not a, I don't, it doesn't have a federal, a government yeah. affiliation, but I think it's kind of funny, and it's mm -hmm. called Eat the Weeds. Yeah. <laughs> you know, Eat the Weeds. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, um, yeah, there's all sorts of resources, like um, non-governmental agencies, there's a ton of those too. So there's a lot of resources out there on what we can do on a personal level, and at the federal level, they're trying. <laughs> they're trying real hard. Um, but yeah. Do you guys have any questions or any burning questions? Comments? Well, thank you for thank joining you. us. I'm going to stop this.